All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Bruce Murray, and as chair of our Democrats Abroad Global Progressive Caucus, also known as PRODA, I'm delighted to welcome all who are joining us from the Americas, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. I'd like to remind everyone that today's panel discussion is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. Closed captioning is available for those who select the live transcription option on the Zoom toolbar. If you have a technical question, please enter it in the chat and our technical assistant Eileen will help you. As we begin, I want to thank everyone who has made this event possible, demonstrating the spirit of not me, us. As 2022 begins, we look back on substantial success in combating COVID and passing long overdue infrastructural legislation to repair and modernize our infrastructure. We also look ahead, ready to tackle the unfinished business of building back better and strengthening our voting rights. As the process continues, ProDA remains focused on the other crucial challenges we confront not least of all the extreme burden of student loan debt for far too many of us. With that in mind, we are especially pleased to welcome the makers of the Scared to Debt series, student loan justice leaders, and U.S. Representative Aroyea Obolewa from the District of Columbia. We applaud and support their efforts as they raise awareness about this problem and encourage action to resolve it. We anticipate a few words from the International Chair of Democrats Abroad, who will be able to join us in about 25 minutes. Right now, I'm pleased to invite Miguel Madrigal, Chair of the Global Youth Caucus, to offer his remarks. Miguel? Thank you, Bruce, and thank you to the Progressive Caucus and our friends at the Student Loan Justice and the Sacred to Debt Film team for organizing this event. On behalf of the Youth Caucus, I'm pleased to join Bruce in welcoming all of you to this call. First of all, I'd like to open by saying that education is one of the founding pillars of having a strong and robust middle class. At the Youth Caucus, education is a cornerstone for our members, as most of them are earning their undergraduate, graduate, and some of them even a postdoctoral degree. Just a quick reminder, according to the US Census Bureau, those with, the, those with a university bachelor's degree or higher turn out to vote in the highest numbers. It's that simple. Education correlates with a higher civic response. Let's try keeping, that, that, keeping it that way. As Democrats, we believe it's time to put pedal to the metal and pressure the Biden administration to come through with its campaign promise on the immediate cancellation of a minimum of $10,000 per person. I'm confident that Joe Biden and Democrats in both the U.S. House and Senate will do the right thing. And as this event will prove, let's not talk about student loan forgiveness. Instead, let's take the bull by, by the horns and call it by its real name, student loan justice. Justice. Remember that. And with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator today, who is Sue Alksness, the vice chair of the Global Progressive Caucus. Sue? Oh, thanks, Miguel, for firing us up. Um, those were great words, and I just want to just want to add that I think there, that correlation between voting and uh, higher education um, is something that uh, the GOP is working to uh, to try to um, play to their advantage through all their voter voter restriction efforts to try to make it harder and harder for people who are lower income and um, with limited access to vote. So, and we know how that affects um, black and brown and people of color in the, the US. So thank you very much. Um, we've all watched the film and if you haven't watched the film, uh, don't worry, you'll be able to follow the conversation and we'll be watching a few clips today too. And uh, the film screening link is, uh, is still open for, for a while. So um, you'll be able to catch up and watch, watch the film. I'm tuning in from the Toronto area and I'm a Connecticut voter. I have three children currently in higher education, uh, two of them in the States, uh, in California and Wisconsin. 
So uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce our panelists individually and ask them to share some brief opening remarks to start our conversation. After that, we have two clips from the film to share and discuss, followed by a chance to take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A function uh, to uh, submit it, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. And if you're watching on Facebook, feel free to share your comments and questions there, and we'll be tracking them as well. So uh, there's a chance that your question on Facebook Live can be addressed uh, to uh, one panelist or, or the entire panel. Uh, just uh, go ahead and comment there, and uh, Caitlin on our team will uh, make sure that the message gets through to us. So as you watched the film and today as you participate, you may find yourself thinking of your own situation or the student loan challenges of your family and friends. Um, I'm thinking today of someone very close to me who co-signed a student loan for a relative's child and is um, really worried about how it's gonna play out. Uh, their experience um, and many experiences uh, far worse than that are, are happening across the country for 45 million people and their families right now while we're talking. So the need is great for uh, addressing this issue. And uh, that's why it's so important to have our discussion today. So I'm gonna start with um, introducing Heather Taylor, who's on our panel. Heather is a reading specialist and a lead volunteer with the organization Student Loan Justice. Heather is the catalyst for bringing us all together today. Uh, currently based in France, Heather helped to organize a similar event with DA France last year, which made a big impression on our Progressive Caucus Chair, Bruce Murray. Since then, Heather has agreed to provide weekly social media posts on student loan justice for our Progressive Caucus to share. And she stepped up as one of the architects and alchemists that made today possible. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, could you take a couple of minutes to tell us why you brought us all together to watch the film and discuss it today? Uh, hi, Sue. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, so I've been volunteering with Student Loan Justice for about a year and uh, with Democrats Abroad for um, just a little bit less time than that. And I'm very happy to be here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share the film, so I may not with all of you. Um, in 2015, Michelle Obama said that she believed that education is the single most important civil rights issue that we have today that we face today. And education is more than a civil rights issue, though. It's an international human rights issue. When I arrived in France three years ago, I believe that the greatest cultural difference that I observed was the right to uh, higher education is treated as a basic human right here. Uh, that was not something that I remembered hearing um, growing up in America, uh, even though I grew up in a family full of educators. And I'd like to read Article 13 from the International Covenant on, on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. This treaty was signed by President Carter in 1977, but it's still sitting in the Senate. It's one of the three core documents of the International Bill of Human Rights. Article 13 states, and I'm going to read verbatim here, higher education shall be made equally accessible to all, on the basis of capacity by every appropriate means, and in particular by the progressive introduction of free education. So you might think, well, then why don't we have free college everywhere in the world, right? Uh, the United States is one of the only countries that has not ratified that treaty, uh, even though they've, President Carter signed it um, before, well before I was born and well before probably anyone in our youth caucus was. I feel that it's my duty as an educator to defend the right to education, to warn my fellow Americans not to take on predatory student loan debt and that they shouldn't be paying predatory student loan debt, um, but they need to know why. When I became the international chapter leader of student loan justice, I set out to find other student loan borrowers living abroad. It can be somewhat isolating to live abroad, especially if you're trying to get involved in political action. And I hoped that we, I could find kindred spirits, other borrowers who are struggling, and that we could volunteer together and help lift one, each up, lift one another up. Uh, as Americans abroad, we don't 
often feel like our voices are recognized in the political arena. And I think that Democrats Abroad does a great job of giving people living all over the world a voice in politics, uh, a way to make real change. And I found that by fostering collaboration through student loan justice and Democrats Abroad, that I'm getting mine back. And that's where the film Sally May Not comes in. This film gives us an avenue to educate our fellow Americans about the corrupt nature of the student lending system. No matter where we are in the world, we don't have to be available to go to a protest in DC. Um, you can teach others uh, from the comfort of your own home, no matter what country you're in. We have representation from so many different uh, parts of the world today, and it's really exciting to see everybody coming together. And I am assuming that you're all here because you believe as strongly in the right to education as I do. Um, as Miguel said, it's really one of the most basic and important principles for, I think, all of us here. Oh, thank you, Heather. We can't, we have to, if we believe in that, uh, in that right, uh, like we have to make it so that we can deliver on that, right? And th that getting an education isn't uh, condemning people to a life of uh, dentured servitude through their, through their loans. So um, I'd like to ask uh, our, invite our, our fil the filmmaker, Michael Camoy, now to sh um, share a few comments. Michael, uh, joins us from his home in Albany, New York. He's a producer and filmmaker of the Sally May Not uh, film. And it won the Audience Choice Award at the Whistleblower Summit and the Film and Film Festival in July, 2021. Uh, the film has screened at Morehouse College Human Rights Film Festival in Atlanta, USC School of Cinema and the Kasdan Institute and Angelica Film Festival in California. Mike is best known for his documentary series, Inside the Blue Line which is screened in Northeastern US and Canadian television markets. Mike's credits include working on such Sundance award-winning films as We the Animals and As You Are. He's directed several short films, including Ruler of Life, Crossing the White Stone, and Relax, which screened in Russia. Mike founded Capital Cinema Cultural Exchange, which hosts the annual Northeast Filmmakers Lab in upstate New York. And Mike can be heard on the upcoming podcast, Ed Up Experience hosted by Joe Salustio. Mike, thanks for providing an opportunity for Americans Abroad to see Sally May Not, uh, created by your company Videos for Change, your production company. Um, Mike, you have some insights to share about the role of film in creating change. It's a big topic, um, but if you can walk us through it quickly, that would be great. Thanks, Mike. Susan, thank you. Uh, Bruce, uh, Heather, everyone behind the scenes and all of uh, our viewers from around the world, thank you for, for having me. You know, I did do a, like a mini study of the impact on film, what film can have. And if we could pull this up, great, there it is. So, you know, it starts with a compelling story that starts to raise awareness. Now with Sally May Not, we already know this is working. When we screened this at USC, the head of the film department said to us, first thing he said, I feel complicit. He was unaware of the lending system that empowers him to be a professor for decades. And other professors have said the same thing. So the first job is to raise awareness. Then the next job is the outreach. And how do you engage people? What you do here is extraordinary with Democrats abroad. And you know, you're, you are the core uh, activist here, but it takes other people uh, maybe longer for them to get in the game. But movies can create a stronger movement and eventually policy reform. And on the next slide, I brought in the movie Inconvenient Truth, right? That once in 2006, it got great reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, and even the audience uh, loved it at 79%. Those are great figures. Now, in, uh, if we can move on to the next slide, in 2017, they needed to produce another movie called the, In the Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. Why is that? Um, because this was such a global issue. Uh, but here, 11 years later, we see that their reviews actually declined while the problem got worse. 
Isn't that fascinating? It's similar to what's going on with the student loan uh, debt crisis. Uh, so, and on the next slide, their three goals were to increase knowledge, raise concern about the impact of global warming and get people activated being willing to reduce greenhouse gases. They uh, had two studies that followed this and, and the outcome is pretty interesting. The moviegoers were more likely to take action within a month towards some of their planned strategies. Countries around the world programmed uh, the, an inconvenient truth. But what they found is that the students did not take that same action a month later. So on the next slide, what was the difference maker in this becoming a global issue? Well, it goes back, in my opinion, goes back to Occupy 2009, which is where Alan was. And what they uh, came out of that is they helped the film by setting up home screenings and they created small discussion groups and they had people meet in their living rooms. Now that's really hard to do during a pandemic, right? But here we are now, we're having something similar. Everybody's in their living room and we're having this conversation, which is exactly how they made this an issue. Uh, and on to the next slide. So films can have an impact on um, a motivated um, populace, but they can also get burnt out and, uh, and they can get fatigued. And so we need to really target exactly where to pinpoint the problem. And to me, it comes down to two things, cost and corruption. I'll speak a little bit more about those and, and in some of our clips, but I wanna just leave you with a quote from Margaret Mead, who founded the Margaret Mead Film Festival as a champion of human rights, who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Again, thank you for having me. Wow, Mike, thanks. Um, that was really helpful to see. And I put in the chat, I'm so grateful to the Occupy movement for the conversation that they, that they started and opened up for the whole nation. So we're gonna turn now uh, to the person who wrote the book that inspired the film. Uh, the book is called The Student Loan Scam, The Most Oppressive Debt in US History and How We Can Fight Back. It's published by Beacon Press, and uh, he's a central figure in the film, Alan Conlinge. Thank you for opening a window on this issue through your activism. Um, Alan, you've worked on this issue for many years, and you have an acute understanding of the issue. Uh, could you tell us how long you've been working on this and share your thoughts on what has been keeping our elected officials from taking action? Well, thank you, Susan. And thanks, thanks to ProDA, by the way, I have to say, you know, international media, international groups seem to have a far better perspective on this problem for some reason. I think just being out of the country gives you all uh, a little more accurate uh, viewpoint. And so I appreciate everyone's comments, particularly Miguel's. Um, so I've been doing this since 2005. I'm very sorry to say uh, what began as a two year project has become a 17-year uh, journey. And, you know, there's many reasons why this problem hasn't been solved in the 17 years that I've been doing this. First of all, um, obviously, we have to talk about partisanship. You know, um, we've had uh, people fighting for us, primarily on the Democratic side, people fighting against us, primarily on the Republican side. And, However, I have to say, it goes a little deeper than that. You know, this uh, segment today that, uh, of, the, of the great film that we're working on, Corruption, plays very deeply, and it plays, unfortunately, both sides of the aisle. You know, in many ways, this problem has been allowed to slip through the partisan cracks, where you have sort of the white hat Democrats and the black hat Republicans fighting, and between the two, um, nothing gets done. And that's probably true for other issues as well. Um, but right now, I think finally, at long last, we're on the precipice. So there's two key issues. Um, the first is really the core of this problem, that, and that is the removal of bankruptcy protections from student loans. They exist for all other loans they've been taking unconstitutionally away from student loans. Uh, but more recently, we have to start talking about loan cancellation now. 
Now, these two concepts are not opposed to each other. They are simpatico. And in fact, um, as a practical matter, I really don't think that we'll see meaningful loan cancellation from Joe Biden unless and until we get the threat of bankruptcy back. So there's a bipartisan bill in the Senate right now, S-2598. We're very hopeful that the that both sides of the aisle can come together on this and um, light a fire under President Biden, who at this point has seemed <clears throat> quite reluctant to do anything major on student loans. Wow, Alan, that's a really interesting perspective. It's, it uh, makes, uh, makes, makes sense and it's sad and uh, we've got to change it. Um, our next panelist uh, I'm, uh, wasn't able to join us. Actually, actually, two of our panelists weren't able to join us today. Um, Tom Borgers um, uh, wasn't able to, to come. There's a COVID related issue and, uh, and Reggie Harris, uh, I think I can share his pipes froze. And so he's in a freezing cold house in the country and uh, unable to join us. So we're really sad not to have Tom. Uh, or Reggie <clears throat> with us, and we hope uh, everything works out well for them. So I, we're going to go ahead and introduce Representative um, Adia Oye. Ah, I'm sorry, Representative Oale. Well, I told myself I'd, I'd get your name right, and there we go. I messed it up. But um, I'm going to um, share that um, Representative Oalewa is a proud Nigerian-American born in Boston, Massachusetts. His parents raised him with the guiding principles of the value of community service and early experience uh, with science, which led to a love of science culminating in achieving a doctorate of pharmacy. He's a current resident of Washington DC's Ward 8 and he's DC's newly elected US representative for DC, committed to fighting for equality for all DC residents by achieving DC statehood. He's also an advocate for student debt relief. Representative Obalewa, we see that you're fighting for DC statehood, which would secure voting rights and sovereignty for DC residents. What, would, what impact would DC statehood have on our fight against the student debt disaster? Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me at the Pro DA. Um, talking about this really important issue of the student debt crisis. In my role as representative, I fight for DC statehood and all legislation really affecting DC residents. And like I said before, <laughs> nothing impacts DC more than student debt. In fact, we're the highest indebted location in America. The average Washingtonian owes more than $55,000 in debt. We have the highest per capita of 16.5%. And like every other state in the United States, the most indebted group of people are 25 to 34 year olds, which just means that this problem is getting worse and worse and worse. And as I see student debt, I believe that's really a true issue in terms of racial inequities. We see black and brown people taking on more debt versus their white counterparts. We see this as an income inequality issue, whereas folks that come from middle class or lower working class incomes are taking on more in debt. And lastly, being a pharmacist, I see this as a huge health issue. Those with looming debt has higher rates of stress, suicides, ideation. So really finding a solution to student debt crisis can really save lives. Now, as a DC resident and looking into this legislation, I think there are plenty of ways to really impact the student debt crisis, not only for folks who owe money now, but for the future borrowers. Number one, changing the bankruptcy protections, allowing those who have student debt to file for bankruptcy, like people who have medical debt or folks who have business debt, like our former president who, went, who were, uh, went for bankruptcy protection seven times over. There's also ways of canceling student debt up to $50,000 as Senator Elizabeth Warren suggested, or even changing the interest rates to 0%. So those who owe, interest, uh, owe student de debt don't fall for predatory practices. You know, it's like, would you sell an 18 year old a house? Probably not, but you can still put them in $400,000 worth of debt. So these are ways that DC residents are really getting involved. And we're also trying to fight for DC statehoods because not only does it affect us in the district of 700,000 Americans without a congressional vote, but it could also really make an impact on those who don't live in the district. So those who live in Las Vegas, those who live in Texas, those who live in Wyoming, those who vote in Connecticut, but live in Paris, can say, you know what? 
having two more senators and representatives from the District of Columbia can impact my life because we can really support things that even if I live in a red state, I can at least trust the folks in the DC to vote on my perspective. I can't so, wait to I can't wait to <laughs> welcome you to a panel uh, and say you're from the great state of the District of Columbia. That will be exactly. a wonderful wonderful day oh my goodness wow well we have a few minutes um, before we hear from our international uh, chair and i'd like to ask bruce to just jump in and share a little bit about um, the core problems that democrats abroad and the progressive caucus volunteers are working hard to address and how everyone listening today can help bruce sure so i think about this a lot and i know you do too along with many of our six thousand pro da members and progressives everywhere in the US and abroad. One of our core problems is that current policies just don't work adequately to address the hardships working families face. What we need is a living wage for all, paid family and medical leave, a livable climate, and much more, including, including affordable, accessible higher education that doesn't doom learners to a future enslaved to a growing ball and chain of debt. Look, we know that too many of our representatives don't listen to ordinary Americans enough, that big money corporate lobbyists have too much influence. And yet, like Alan says, and Sally may not, we also know in our hearts that ultimately the people have the power. That's why we stand with Democrats abroad to help ordinary Americans leverage that power. First, Democrats abroad volunteers help Americans overseas to vote. Equally important, DA with its caucuses and task forces helps Americans overseas advocate for the change we need. Through events like this, call storms to Washington and much more. Take a look any day at the DA events offered around the world, and you'll see a global mobilization of people power to meet our most urgent needs. Even with our volunteer energy, there are real costs to achieve results. Those costs are associated with all the tools we use to get out the vote, raise awareness about the issues we face, and provide options to take action in support of real solutions that benefit us all. As I said at the outset, we believe in not me, us. Many of us likely recall the source of that mantra in a campaign for which the average donation was $27. Well, we have a slightly different approach with a similar goal. Anyone who can donate today will be helping Americans to exercise their crucial right to vote, be better informed when casting their ballots and ready to take action, and have their gift matched by a DA member in Asia Pacific. For a limited time, every donation via ProDA's donation page will be matched until we reach a total of $2,500 donated. Today, our goal is 45 donations in honor of the 45 million Americans and their families who are plagued by corrupt student loans that disproportionately affect women, people of color, and students who are unable to complete their studies for whatever reason. We hope each of us will donate at least $4.50 toward this important work now. If we donate $14.50 or a little more with the match, our average could increase to $29. As progressives, we have much unfinished business for 2022. Thank you for your donations and thank you to our matching gift donor. Thank you, Bruce. Oh, oops. Thank you, Bruce. Sorry. I'm having a little technical issue here. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, we have uh, thank you, and everybody, please donate. It really will make it really will make a difference. Uh, DA is a super effective organization, working like clockwork. Not not including my little glitch there. Uh, so Candace is here, our international chair, Candace Kariston, the international chair of Democrats Abroad. Um, thank you for joining us. We'd love to hear uh, what you want to share with us today. 
Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Sue. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, really, to everyone involved with this event, from the Progressive Caucus to the Global Youth Caucus, our friends at Student Loan Justice, and last but not least, the Scared to Debt film team uh, for putting together this event. And to all of you for joining us tonight uh, or this morning, wherever you are in the world, very excited to have you here. Uh, and as a representative of the Democrats Abroad Executive Committee, uh, I just wanted to extend this warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I currently am the youngest state party chair in the Democratic Party, the second youngest ever in the Democratic Party. Uh, and this issue really reigns true. Uh, it hits home to me uh, as someone who graduated college uh, in recent times. Uh, a lot of people graduating from college at this point uh, are hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. I have friends who cannot uh, live the life that you would think after having attended school uh, because they are so plagued by their student loan debt. Uh, so this really is an issue, as all of you know, that is really challenging for people, uh, the under 35s in particular. As you know, we are facing quite a few challenges this year, especially as Corona continues, uh, especially as issues like student loan uh, repayment continue. I just wanted to assure you of one thing, and that is that Democrat stateside, despite what you might be feeling, hearing uh, in the news, uh, are working around the clock, as Sue said. We are here too at Democrats Abroad, uh, our colleagues in Washington, in state capitals around the country. We are working to deliver and make a real difference in the lives of everyday Americans like you and me. As I already said, for too many Americans, the burden of student debt postpones and obstructs them from achieving their dreams. During this election year, I encourage everyone to learn about the candidates and find those who align with you and your values and your aspirations for America. I urge you, especially if you are one of our uh, overseas voters, to go to votefromabroad.org right now, fill out your ballot. You'll get it for all 2022 elections. There are some very exciting primary races coming up uh, in the first and second quarter of 2022. And this is really your chance to determine uh, again, who's going to face off against Republicans? This is about the future of the Democratic Party, uh, and this is your opportunity to make your voice heard. You'll be able to vote in your state's primary and general elections, uh, and we encourage you then to make sure that all of your friends and family are doing the same, be they uh, back in the U.S. or living overseas. With that call to action, I want to thank our panelists again for joining us today, and I'll toss it back over to Sue Alexson, as Vice Chair of the Progressive Caucus. Thanks, Candace. Ah, good words to fire us up, get us going. So we're gonna uh, take a look at a clip now. Um, Mike uh, has a little introduction to, uh, uh, to the clip and then we'll watch it. Hey, thank you, Susan. Um, uh, I'd just to say a few words. So since 1980, the cost of college has risen 169%, while wages for 22 and 27 year olds has only risen by 19%. The cost of college is what brings people on the right and the left together about this issue. What has driven the cost of college is the absence of breaks on the entire lending system, which evolved drastically since the creation of Sally May in 1972. And in this scene, the subjects speak to where Heather began and Alan takes us. Who is accountable? Who's culpable, complicit? in removing these breaks and leading to the soaring cost of college, which Representative Owaleya reminds us, this now impacts our health. Please roll the clip. That building behind us built this bubble. They inflated this debt balloon and they need to take responsibility for it. And that's why we're here. The founders of this country knew what it was like to have extraordinary debt, which they had from England at the time. And they wanted to make sure that the people didn't end up in a debtor's prison for the rest of their lives. The people of this country hold all the gold. I mean, really, we hold almost all the power. And it's a matter of exercising that power. I believe that the student debt is at a point where soon it will falter. It, it impacts the entire path of their economic life. Do you see this as a macroeconomic risk? As this goes on and as student loan continues to grow and becomes larger and larger, then it absolutely could hold back growth. 
It's there. We haven't done anything about it. It's just a festering wound waiting to be cured by a scalpel. I think a loan among all kinds of debt, uh, we don't allow student loan debt to be discharged in bankruptcy. Right. I'm, I'd be at a loss to, to explain why that should be the case. All right. So as we saw uh, in the clip, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Jer Jerome Powell, uh, he was talking in 2018 when student debt totaled $1.4 trillion. And it's now uh, it's now uh, almost $2 trillion. And he thought it was a th threat to the economy at that time. So uh, he couldn't see a reason why student debt loan borrowers would be prevented from discharging that debt through bankruptcy. But clearly there is a reason. Somebody is benefiting. Alan, can you explain... Uh, how the student loan industry makes a profit through defaulted loans? You know, that is the perfect question. You know, uh, even without defaults, you know, $100 billion a year clicks off an in interest alone on this debt. This is for a lending system that uh, President LBJ declared would be free of interest back in 1965. But even aside from all that, in the absence of bankruptcy protections, in the absence of statutes of limitations, uh, fair debt collection practices, uh, restricted truth in lending, not there for federal student loans, it turns out that defaulted loans become more profitable than loans that remain in good stead. And, you know, a credit card company is uh, thrilled if they make back 10 cents on the dollar on a defaulted account. Well, the lending industry can make many times more than the original uh, loan for defaulted student loans. And in fact, many years of White House budget data show that even the Department of Education makes more, they, they bring in more money on a defaulted loan than they pay out. So even the Federal uh, Department of Education is turning a not insignificant profit on defaulted loans. Wait, but how, but how? Well, when you take bank when you take bankruptcy away, it's essentially a license to steal. When you take statutes of limitations away, you can follow the borrowers for the rest of their lives. So, uh, like one person I talked to this morning, she originally borrowed twenty six thousand dollars. She fell into default, and then she rehabilitated her loans, and she did everything they told her to do. Well, today. She has paid back $92,000 on a $26,000 loan. She still owes $132,000 on this debt. I mean, th these are the sort of uh, non nonsensical cartoonish numbers that we're seeing uh, for federal student loans. Pr private loans aren't great either, but the, the student loans, uh, the federal loans are really uh, wicked tools of indenture and unearned wealth extraction, right. I would say. Okay, and and um, Alan, I just wanna ask you also about the, consti the constitution. So um, someone, uh, Betsy Atori shared with us this question um, that she says in article one, section eight of the constitution in, in a section establishing bankruptcy laws for debtors. It says we're establishing bankruptcy laws for debtors, not for loaners, but lenders, but for debtors. Um, uh, it states that, uh, that to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcy throughout the United States. And Betsy's asking, could we consider that removing bankruptcy protection for student loans is somehow unconstitutional, which you said in your introductory comments, Alan, that it is unconstitutional. Um, for instance, if bankruptcy is a constitutional right for the protection, protection of debtors, can you, can you explain the constitutional right? Bankruptcy is absolutely a constitutional right. The founding fathers themselves were being savaged under debt to British banks and merchants. So it should come as no surprise that they called for uniform bankruptcy laws ahead of the power to declare war, ahead of the power to raise an army. Uh, and here today, uh, federal student loans and private student loans, are the only type of loan in our nation's history to be uniquely stripped of this protection. You know, we're also guaranteed equal protection under the law. And tell me why, and Jerome Powell would agree with me, tell me why student loan bar.
Uh oh, I think we have a uh, technical problem here. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Oh, there he is. Sorry, oh. Alan, you froze briefly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just uh, these loans are absolutely unconstitutional, and um, there's no good reason for singling out student loans aside, apart from all other loans to be uniquely precluded from the same equal protection under the law that every other borrower for every other type of loan enjoys. And this okay. is the kid who knows under the tent, because if they can do this to student loans, they can do it to any type of debt. They, right. I mean, here you I'm hearing murmurs in Washington, D.C. about doing a similar uh, undue hardship uh, barrier for bankruptcy for medical debt. So th this is a much bigger fight even than student loans here. Wow. OK, uh, so I have a question uh, from the Q&A chat. I'm going to share it and I'm going to invite uh, everyone to go ahead and use the Q&A to uh, provide some other some other um, questions. And I'm going to open this up to the panel. Uh, so, uh, you know, let us know if you, you have an answer. Um, the question is, why hasn't there been more groups pushing for bankruptcy protection and the bills S 2598 and HR 4907, which address private student loan bankruptcy protection along with full debt cancellation? In any case, we need to make S 2598 viral like a hashtag uh, S2598 Fresh Start or HR4907 Private Student Loan. So um, any of our panelists want to jump in on this? I think you could uh, unmute and turn on your camera and we'll see if we have dueling mics going. Well, Sue, I'll, I'll jump in um, and just share that I always find it amazing that you can be a university of president and you know what's going on you know what's behind these loans and what's not there for your customer but when sally may was set up by albert lord he said the students aren't my customer the universities are my customer they're in it to make money and the professors that are learning about this may ultimately be able to put some pressure on their school board, their trustees. But up until this point, they haven't acted because they are so built into the system and they need this every September and January for these loan payments to come and fuel their school and their, which has risen so dramatically. So there's one group that we find uh, as part of the, the complicit and culprit groups that haven't spoken and they should be speaking up for uh, this new legislation to protect their primary customer, which is the students. Right, right, yeah. Um, thanks, Mike. Heather, I wonder, um, do you think that it has something to do partly with people being like embarrassed and being alone in their, in what they owe and um, not talking about it? I think maybe for young people, they're comfortable talking about it, but I think for co-signers who are parents and retired, I think they're very quiet. I, I don't know, I mean, someone in a very, very, um, embarrassed way shared with me recently about a loan that they co-signed and they don't even want to talk to the uh, the original borrower much about it. It's so awkward and difficult. Yeah, I think that there is a lot of shame around having student loan debt. Um, if you spend any time on social media, you'll see uh, student borrowers being vilified and told to just pay back your debts. Um, you shouldn't have taken out debt that you couldn't afford. And uh, see i'm seeing that the issue is being minimized constantly and i think that that discourages people from opening up and talking about their student loan debt they don't want to be a target of that um, as far as the senate bill 2598 and the house bill 4907 i have not seen other organizations fighting for these bills uh, other than student loan justice however those are uh, s2598 is a bipartisan effort so we have Senator Dick Durbin from Illinois, Democrat, as a co-sponsor, uh, joined by Senator Cornyn from Texas, a Republican. So I think that that's a great place to start some bipartisan conversations, maybe he'll start healing some divisions uh, to stand behind bills that will help all of us. Yeah. Well, um, Heather, you mentioned that, uh, and I'll open this up to everybody, but uh, I think uh, Alan and others might have ideas, but um, you mentioned uh, in your opening comments, like don't, you know, if, you, if you're going to school, don't 
fall prey to to um, to these unfair unfair loans. And we have a question in the chat that says uh, from uh, Laura from uh, Laura currently for today's students before changes can be made. So in the current situation, what we what we have going on now, what alternative does an aspiring student have aside from these predatory loans? If they don't have uh, any upfront capital uh, to pay for their education, do they have do they have options um, beyond these predatory loans? Does uh, um, yeah. Anyone? So uh, Dr. John Oberg uh, said, or excuse me, uh, John Oberg said recently uh, he's a political scientist, and he said recently that we should look at how the German system uh, funds college. So I did. I looked into the German system. And the German system is actually allowing Americans to go to college for free, as well as German citizens. That used to be true in many other countries in the EU. Uh, not everyone can go to just get up and go to college in Germany, though, right? That's not a solution for all of our high school seniors. Um, I think that what we need to do is make sure that this student, that the student loan scam is over before school starts next year. I don't think that there's any way to uh, justify telling anyone to go to an American school um, and to take on student loan debt. I wish that I could take back taking on student debt. Um, I can't, none of us can. I can't uh, get it waived with bankruptcy, but they, the problem is, is that you can't repossess someone's education. So if you're a student loan borrower, you are the product. You're not a you're not a person. You're not a human with human rights anymore. You are a, a financial product, and I cannot, in good conscience, tell anyone that they should go to college, that they should sign up for that. If they want to go to college, they should be fighting for free education, take a gap year, um, get involved, fight for their right to go to school, uh, join okay. us in fighting for that. Yeah, I mean, I would throw in consider going to school in Canada. It's not free. It's it's less, but at the same time. Not everybody can relocate. There's all the uh, living expenses if you move away uh, from home where you might have, uh, you're, you're in shared living with your family. And um, we have a comment in the chat that they have Canadian student debt and so do my kids. So um, for sure there's, there's an issue uh, here as well. So, all right, we're gonna look at another clip. Uh, keep oh. the questions coming, coming in. Um, we've got folks working on, uh, on those questions and um, we'll get them to the panelists. So um, Mike, can you, uh, Cue up the next clip for us. Sure, Susan. Um, this is such a vibrant conversation. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, you know, I want to just go back in time. In 1971, Lewis Powell addressed the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in what today is now known as the Powell Memo. And I learned this from Alan early on. It was in Powell's address that he attacks the far left, the media, and liberal universities for corrupting American students who challenge our corporations, our US, and, and this challenge was costing US corporations too much money. It's interesting because Powell is a registered Democrat and uh, went on as associate Supreme Court justice and wrote this, and he won people over. In the, in the memo, he targets the clean cut, well-spoken, Harvard educated Ralph Nader, who goes on to become America's greatest consumer advocate. Less than a year later in 1972, Sally May is created, which privatizes the lending system, goes for profit, removes consumer protections, ultimately leading to skyrocketing costs and indenturing students, particularly women and people of color. They knew what they were doing. And unfortunately, I believe Lewis Powell won. Let's roll the clip. This is greed without limitation. The U.S. government set up a predatory lending system for students and engaged in what I would describe as massive fraudulent inducement, um, encouraging students to take on debt that they knew they couldn't afford. How, how could you lend them all that money and they have no capacity to pay it back? You're setting them up to fail and you know it you are committing gross negligence if you were a banker you could be locked up for doing that all 
All right, so um, sorry Tom isn't with us today because uh, he has a long uh, and uh, impressive uh, resume in, uh, in uh, financial fraud, um, but I wanna ask the rest of the panel about this. So, uh, so Tom said in that clip um, that uh, if you were a banker, you'd be locked up for doing that. So, so, so Tom is saying that it's illegal what's happening in the student loan industry, and yet no one's getting locked up. So uh, I, I guess I'd be interested in how specifically we would, like what are the different ways in which student loans are fraudulent? How are they fraudulently granted and managed uh, by the industry? And, imp and importantly, like why does that fraud continue without anyone being locked up? Like who's responsible for making it so things that should be illegal are not illegal? Can someone, explain that to us? I can give you two quick examples of, it's not just the lies, it's also the omissions. Two quick, there's many, but I'll just pick two out of the air. So students and their families, when they go to tour university campuses and they go, oh, this looks like a great thing. So what is your default rate? What, what percentage of your students wind up in default on their loans? The colleges will almost always say, oh, our default rate is low. It's 5%. Well, in fact, the universities are actually telling the students and their families the cohort default rate, which is just a tiny sliver of the true default rate and only counts loans that default in the first like two years or three years after graduation. So while the true default rate is maybe 30, 35 percent, um, the students and their families are lied to by the college, in fact, and this happens universally. But you know, there's also omissions. So when students are reading the financial aid paperwork, um, uh, when they're going through loan cancellation, it doesn't say, um, by the way, bankruptcy are, is essentially not available for student loans. Instead, it says, you can discharge your loans in bankruptcy if you can prove undue hardship. Now to an 18 year old kid, that sounds pretty reasonable, right? Okay, all right, hardship. Like, like they even know what bankruptcy is in the first place. But the truth of the matter is, it is essentially impossible to prove undue hardship. In a recent year, 149,000 people filed for bankruptcy, had student loans, fewer than 20 got even partial relief. So that's just two examples. I could go on probably for three hours with more, but I'll leave it at that. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, wow, okay. Um, so so I could, yeah, go ahead, Mike. I, I can add um, just a little bit, but uh, you know, if Tom was here, he'd really be infuriated that again, back to my point about the university presidents being quiet about this, because in essence, the universities are fiduciaries and they give out the loan. They'll tell people to go down to the bursar's office and Alan said, you know, nobody reads the fine print. You're having an 18 year old and, and they don't even know that in the fine print that they have no protections. And again, it goes back to who, for me, who, who's your customer and nobody ever asks the family. So in terms of how did that come about? Um, you know, you can look to and why it stays in place. You can look to the university lobbies, lobbyists, uh, universe, and the education lobbyists. They are the most powerful, I'm told, in the country, next to the gun lobbies. Now, the gun lobby, they were very successful in being able to say, anybody who sells a gun is not liable. They wanted that specifically so that the shop owner wouldn't be held you know, liable or the bullet reseller wouldn't be held liable. And, and while we have some things in place, we know that the system has been set up such that things can fall through the crack and we can blame it on this or blame it on that. But if we go back to why it's this lobby and they're very, very powerful. Um, and to me, it goes back to the cost, who's making the money. And so it stays in place, unfortunately, just like other issues that uh, concerned Democrats abroad. Wow. Okay. All right. So I'm going to share uh, another question that um, came in from, from folks joining us today. Um, RF relates 
that uh, the problem, he relates the problem to sub, the subprime mortgage crisis and saying it's no different than the subprime lending of the 2000s. How many bankers were locked up after 2009? We know the answer to that question. Oh it's boy, I wish I wish Tom was here because uh, Tom Tom investigated Sue. He was the lead person on the mortgage uh, lending crisis, and uh, yeah, he, he would be able to answer why nobody uh, was arrested. Yeah, yeah. Does Tom ever say that anybody ever will, or I guess has the boat sailed on that for for subprime mortgages? Oh, I think in terms of that, I think the boat has sailed. Uh, I don't know if uh, the representative has any insights into some of this. Yes, and I'm glad um, you gave me the opportunity. So not only have we seen parallels to the subprime mortgage crisis where folks who weren't ready to take on large loans were giving large loans, we've also seen similar things with the PPP loans. What was happening was that these banks were trusted to dole out these applications and they were getting paid by the government to do so but without any real incentive to proofread and make sure these applications were um, pretty much authentic, they were just giving out so much money. And what we're seeing now is that those who are charged with PPP fraud are going to jail, but these banks are still keeping those profits from the fees from the government. So one thing that my office does resolution was try to hit these financial institutions with fines. Because when we try to go after people to get them arrested, they say they blame the low level banker. When we try to take them to court, they settle, like maybe it just settle pains of the dollar of what the damage they've, they've caused. So I believe that one of the key ways for us to really rein in this behavior is disincentivize these financial institutions for taking advantage of people who just don't know any better. I and mean, we're talking about young people. How often do we teach them financial literacy? They know their ABCs, they know their one, two, threes, but they don't know how to balance their budget. So we're really trusting on young people to make life-changing decisions. And I don't think the government is on the side of the people to make sure that these young people are really knowing what they're getting themselves into. Right, yeah. And I've seen some pretty scary data about how this is affecting older people as well, that they're, that like the original amount that they were, uh, was loaned to them, like Alan's example, like, you know, might be 20,000, 25, 35,000. And then over time, they're paying back 100, 150,000, like, more and more and more and, and they're just continue to um as they age oh more and it might be that they've co-signed on a younger person's uh loan as well <clears throat> so um there's a question that's come in from the audience about um are there any plans to get this documentary on a large platform like netflix it could sway public opinion if it's seen on a mass scale so what's what's involved in getting more people uh, to see this i I imagine Mike might have something to say or. Um... Sure. So what it takes um, uh, actually is a couple of things. One is funding. Uh, two, uh, you need to have been in uh, to Netflix or HBO. And if you look at what they're doing still, they're doing more commercial kinds of things. Well, we'd love to be there. Um, I was just talking with one of my colleagues from one of the Sundance films that I, I worked on. Um, and won some big prizes. He's like, Mike, this is a really hard industry and you're doing great. You won the Audience Choice Award um, and you're in other film festivals. That's how it works uh, to start. Hopefully somebody discovers you and uh, opens that door to uh, Netflix or HBO or somebody, somebody independent like that. Corporations tend to shy away from these topics that really do divide people and politically, so you know they're going for entertainment for the most part. So it's not impossible, um, but like Inconvenient Truth, uh, you know they they started that door to door, setting up screenings in people's homes. So uh, and then eventually, I think it was on Netflix, but they didn't wait. Uh, they made sure they got it to their audience. They knew the audience would be there. Oh my gosh, the audience will be there for student loans, like 45 million Americans plus their plus their families, like the, the audience is there, whether it's a documentary or even, I don't even know, have there even been fictional treatments on a person dealing with student loans? Uh, I don't know. The next question um, we have is uh, from our audiences for um, Representative Owalewa. And the question is if there are any DC initiatives um, 
that we could adopt as a model for state level remedies? Do other states have good initiatives? Are there, are there things that can happen at the state level uh, related to student loans or are we stuck with the federal approach? Can you share any insights on that? To be honest, I think every measure counts. I mean, right now we're seeing elected officials really taking on um, student justice as a platform. But like I said, the power is with the people. I've knocked on doors in West Virginia. I've gone out with folks who don't look like me, don't vote like me, to really care about things that affect what's going on. And I believe that's really the way to make that change. I believe that elected officials are often very reactionary. And if they see things online or they see people that's living in their backyard say something, they really start paying attention. One thing we noticed with this pandemic is that the world's much smaller place. We're now connected with people we've never met before that we'll never see otherwise, or really making sure that our voices are getting out there. We don't have to wait for NBC. We don't have to wait for the big platform to accept us. We can make our own stand. We can have our right. own platform. Anybody else on the panel who um, has thoughts on this? I, I would just echo Representative uh, 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 oh, then, uh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your last Owalewa. name. Oh, Olewa. Oh, Olewa. Yeah. You can just call me Oya. Oh, yeah. I'm so oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Just call me Oya. Oh, yeah. And you know, by the, by the way, <laughs> average student loan debt is about 37000 Average student loan debt in the District of Columbia is $55,000, heads and shoulders above the rest of the country. But you know, you, you say, um, you're so right. I mean, word of mouth is so important. People need to throw off the the bonds of uh, the, the chains of shame and, and humiliation, we need to start talking to each other about this. 45 million people in the country with federal student loans, 40 million of them were probably never going to be able to repay these loans before the pandemic. I mean, 40 million, taller, 40 million voters is the largest untethered voting block in certainly my lifetime. So We've got a huge muscle to flex, but people need to get up and get out and don't be ashamed to reach out to others. And, um, you know, let's get together on this. Uh, when when <laughs> we uh, work together, we can get this done. Uh, thank you, Alan. Um, what do folks think about the uh, electoral chances for Democrats if they take on uh, the student loan uh, corruption scam uh, actively? Will that will that lead to more votes for Democrats or will that be problematic? What, what do people think? I would just quickly point out Georgia is a perfect example of how the Democrats right now are, are benefiting on this issue. Joe Biden, um, despite his, quite frankly, backsliding since the election, he was promising bankruptcy. He was promising loan cancellation and people believed it. And I think that's the only reason that uh, Georgia race was close. Many other Republican uh, red states, um, student loan debt exceeds the entire state budget. So it's not just Georgia, it's North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, Texas, uh, Tennessee, many other Southern states. Okay, wow. Yeah, so I have a question that Re uh, Representative Owaleo and maybe others might want to uh, comment on. So it's kind of a two-part question. Um, there's one, one question is around the connection between student loan, uh, the burden of student loans and Medicare for all, and whether uh, this student loan problem is getting in the way of Medicare for all because doctors are so anxious about how much uh, they, can, they can earn. Uh, to pay off their loans. And then, and then also a question about um, how historically African-Americans were denied access to credit from the 30s to the 70s uh, through the redlining process. And it's interesting to hear that many younger Americans of all backgrounds have been decimated not by denial of credit, but by unfettered access to it at a young age and within a system that essentially forces young people into it. Um, do we think there's a connection of this legacy here, this idea of, of denying credit uh, to, um, to Black people or, you know, in these earlier times and now using credit uh, to take advantage of them? Yes, that's an amazing question. And when we talk about you know, folks who are told from a young age to pursue higher education, because that would be our way up, and you find out later on that now you're saddled with $100,000 of debt that's climbing within every year, it really creates a, a sense of what did I do this for? Or it creates a sense of now I'm stressed out, and I wanna end my life. In terms of Medicare for all and student debt, I believe that's something you can do both at the same time. 
if a doctor doesn't have any more debt, then maybe their focus on raise, getting as much money as possible isn't there. And on top of that, on the flip side of you know the universal healthcare, if you as a pharmacist, if had I known that every single person can be taken care of regardless of price, then my experience would be better. Now, right now with this pandemic, one of the reasons why this vaccine effort has been so successful is because regardless of how much money you make, what insurance you have, whether you're documented or not, you can get vaccinated. If that mm -hmm. could work in the worst of times, the universal health care could be a solution, even our most normal of times. Wow. Okay. Thank you. So, oh boy, we still have questions, but we're, we're uh, I, I have a question I want to uh, direct to Heather um, and we'll see if we have more time for questions after this, although I, I'm not, I'm not sure. We'll see. So uh, this question, uh, Heather, has to do with the most effective remedy for student loan industry corruption and how can we, uh, how can we make that remedy a reality? What concrete actions can each of us uh, here on the call today uh, and watch the recording, what can we do to contribute to the effort for student loan justice and ending corruption in the student loan industry? Thank you, Sue. Um, I believe we have a slide for this, if we could pull it up and I can talk through the actions with some visual aids for everyone. Why don't you go ahead, Heather, and get started? And oh, there we go. Excellent. Perfect. So, um, for our first action here, I've said to send a personal message by Mayday. And that personal message is crafted so that you can send a letter to President Biden, um, to your state governor, to your senators, your representatives at the uh, federal and state levels, and to your attorney generals. And you'll see here in the bold text, you can fill in with the personal details. And at the bottom, we've got different closing requests that would fit with uh, direct actions that we're asking each of them to take. So for example, for President Biden, in the closing request, we'd ask for him to please sign the executive order to cancel all federal student loans and restore bankruptcy rights to all loans. And there are, um, we're asking senators to co-sponsor Bill S5298. And for other representatives, we're asking them to publicly call on President Biden to uh, fulfill his campaign promise to cancel student loans, to restore economic justice. It was part of his, the Biden plan uh, to build back better by advancing racial equity across the American economy. He had promised to cancel student loan debt for all students who went to public universities, to historically black colleges and universities, uh, yeah, historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutions. Um, I'm sure you've all noticed that that's being denied um, in the media constantly, that that, that that claim was ever made. Many people say he never promised to cancel student debt. Um, he definitely did, and we're asking him to cancel even more than he promised to cancel during his campaign because 10,000, 50,000, 75,000, uh, like Roosevelt uh, Institute recommends in cancellation, won't help the borrowers that are the most disenfranchised. It won't help the people who have $400,000 in student debt, and it won't help us end the student loan scam so that we can move forward and move toward education is a human right for American citizens. Um, so this letter, um, it's in a link that's going to be dropped in the chat for all of you. You can edit it to fit your own voice. And um, there are clips from the film and a link to for them to sc uh, screen the film on show and tell as um, most many of you all have uh, today. And can we go to the second action? So the second action here is to sign the petition. This is the petition that Alan started. It's um, directed to President Biden to cancel federal student loans and return bankruptcy protections. We have over 1 million petition signers and it's growing all the time. And I find that the petition is the best way to see uh, a concrete example of the talking points of student loan justice, what exactly we're fighting for, and Alan is very good about updating the petition and letting people know what's happening with student loan justice. And then for our third action, 
watch and share the film uh, before the screening window ends. And we'll have a link in the chat for the petition and for the film as well. And you can see here it's um, on the Show and Tell website. And this was opened up uh, thanks to this joint effort between Democrats Abroad and um, Mike with the film and Student Loan Justice. And sharing the film is going to be, I think, one of the most powerful ways for us to continue to educate people about the student loan industry, about what's happened to student borrowers, why it's happened to them. And once we understand that, we can move forward and fix this. We can move forward and secure education as a human right. Oh. Thanks, Heather. Um I'm going to uh, encourage the panelists to take a look at the open questions we still have in the chat. And if you'd like to type a response to any of them, you can do that either privately to the person who posed the question or, uh, or publicly so that everybody can see the question and the answer, which might be interesting uh, to folks to see. And um, I am going to suggest that based on uh, Heather's uh, suggestions of actions, we can take that um, each of us might think for a minute about um, who we know and what networks are we in that we might share, uh, that we might share the film with um, in the time that's left for it to be, uh, to be, to be watched. Um, I think that ends later today. Um, is there any chance of that being uh, extended maybe? So, um, you know, I saw that there's hundreds of people who had signed up for this and it, it would be really great if we could, uh, I, and I'll permit leaving the channel open for a couple of days, let's say till Wednesday. Would that help if we added two more uh, days, 48 hours? Well, I think so. I mean, it's up to the folks in the chat. That's amazing, uh, Mike. Uh, so yeah, till Wednesday would be great. That gives us a chance to share a little more actively and um, folks can use the what's in the chat to, oh, we've got Faith saying, yes, thank you. <laughs> That's awesome uh, in the chat. Awesome. So You're wonderful. Welcome, and um, yeah, so um, I think the link directly to the show and tell um, screening would be the best thing to for people to share now that our panel discussion has taken place. So maybe um, Heather or Mike, you could drop that the link right right in there, and then everybody on the call can say, "Hey, until what's what's the cutoff? Probably Wednesday, sometime Wednesday." Yeah, let's say midnight midnight Wednesday. Uh... You know, that gives us two and a half days to yep. get the word out, uh, get these yep. uh, calls to action out. Awesome. Oh, that's fabulous. Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you to hey, everybody Sue, on the call I want for sharing. To, uh, chime in here and say that uh, I think that is awesome too, Mike. Thank you very, very much for that. I'm going to jump in here with one more action. Okay. Uh, to have student loan justice, we need elected representatives up and down the ballot. That's what we've been talking about who listen and truly represent the best interests and values of us. The Democratic primaries, remember this is a midterm year uh, for 2022 are starting now. First one is in Texas on March 1st. And this wow. is our chance to vote our values. We want uh, to encourage everyone to vote and uh, look to see what is going on in your state and congressional districts up and down the ballot. And we encourage you right after this meeting to go to, you've heard this before, go to votefromabroad.org to register to vote and request your ballot. In Texas, it's already getting uh, to be the 11th hour for requesting your ballot because of the way voting is going in Texas right now. And if you vote in Texas or know Texas voters, or even if you don't know Texas voters, Still share with your networks. The time is running out to vote from abroad in the Texas primaries. Share broadly uh, the information sheet that uh, we have created for the Texas primaries. And by the way, get ready because we're creating them for other states on DECAR, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, North Carolina. And this is a very important year to get out and vote and to be well informed about who is fighting for us on important issues like student loan justice. The Progressive Caucus has identified some important Texas primaries to watch where voters can help decide who will be the Democratic candidate winning in November. We're dropping that link into the chat as well. All right. Wow. 
Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, voting is not the only answer. Like we know that we can elect them and they they can listen to other uh, other people's money, but voting is part of the is part of the answer, and uh, it's important that we exercise that. Right. So we're uh, coming up on the end of the hour, and uh, so I would like to invite our panelists to make some closing remarks. So um, we'll do a lightning round real fast, uh, maybe 30 seconds each, um, sort of what your key key things you'd like to share. Uh, and I'd like to start with um, Representative Oalewa. Oalewa, what would you like to share in closing today? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Pro-DA. Um, I'm very honored to be part of this Fight First student debt justice. And as we fight for justice, just remember that getting us closer to that would be allowing us to become a state. So continue to fight for DC statehood because it allows America to be a much more fair and equal place to live. And again, I thank you all for having me. Oh, thank you. Um, Mike, how about you? I see something interesting happening in the chat. Absolutely. Um, you know, I want to make one more point in my uh, closing points, and that is if Tom Borders was, were here, he would remind us that in addition to the, you know, the health and medical concerns and costs, we also, there's other sectors of the economy like housing. 52% um, of the Gen Z, that's 18 to 29 year olds, are still living at home, according to Pew Research. 37% of the millennials age 39 to 54 say student loans is delaying the purchase of a home, which we know then leads to getting married, starting a family, which is also contributing to the declining U.S. birth rate. Uh, um, it, it goes on. Uh, but the fact that this is now a multi-generational issue that's being passed on um, it should be highly concerning. And what it costs our U.S. economy. Um, and eventually we're going to we're going to get to all the corruption that's behind this. Um, and uh, we're going to stay fast uh, and strong on our on completing this series. So thanks again for having me. We will do it. And thank you for bringing it to to the attention of Democrats abroad. We're, we're so grateful uh, to you, Mike. And uh, Alan, you have been uh, in this fight uh, alone a lot of the time in the early days and now momentum is momentum is building thanks for joining us um, what do you, how, how do you how do you want to send us on our way today well thank you and i agree please everyone out there make this my last year fighting this battle i'm done i'm getting old are we not um one quick point you know mike said it's uh speaking of the uh, millennials and so forth one quick factoid i know a lot of people out there i recognize there are more people over the age of 50 with student loans than under the age of 25. And they owe three times more. So if you're over 50, like I am, um, don't think this is a younger person's problem. This is our problem. We owe, And we owe far more than the younger group, despite having borrowed far less. So we are so strong. The, the one action item I will tell everybody to do, um, call both of your senators and tell them as strongly as possible, particularly if they're Republican, to co-sponsor and push for S2598. And I think that will be the domino that finally solves this problem. Mm. Well, the argument for this aligning with conservative values, uh, this reform uh, aligning with conservative values is strong, Alan. And I saw you, uh, you ran an article uh, to that effect on the Student Loan Justice uh, website recently. So uh, if anybody is looking for an opportunity to have a conversation with family and friends who are on the other side of the aisle, this is one where you can find common ground and agree uh, agree about it uh, once they understand the once they understand the facts. So I think there's a really good opportunity uh, opportunity there uh, for us. Um, and it, this also crosses the uh, progressive versus liberal Democrats uh, uh, camps. This is something we can all get behind as Americans. Uh, Heather, what about you? Anything? What would you like to share? Um, yeah, I just um, I want to start by just saying that I am really grateful to everybody who worked together to make this event happen today. I hope that uh, anyone who is a student loan borrower who's watching this either live or in the recording uh, feels like they have a little bit of their agency back and that they'll be able to use um, this film to um, spread 
awareness about the corruption in the lending industry and really start to protect themselves and defend themselves that we can organize and fight this together. And I'd say if you could um, donate your time, that's the most valuable thing for us with the film and with Student Loan Justice. Um, but if you can't donate your time and you want to donate money either to uh, continuing the into um, continuing the film, uh, we're going to have a series uh, coming from the film, right? So if, if you want to help fund the series or fund the work we're doing at Student Loan Justice, um, we're all all a volunteer organization at Student Loan Justice. People from both sides of the political spectrum and everywhere in between, um, just working together to fight for students. Well, thanks, Heather. Miguel, would you like to share some closing comments on behalf of the Youth Caucus? Absolutely. <clears throat> well, thank. Uh, first of all, thank you, Sue, uh, to Representative Owolewa. We are so with you. DC statehood now. I've been to DC five times, and the next I hope that the next time I visit DC, I can call it the state of the Douglas Commonwealth. Let's pass HR fifty one and S fifty one now. I'd also like to thank Sue, Bruce, the Progressive Caucus, and the members of the Student Loan Justice Team for organizing this great event. Hey, and if you're watching this and you feel as frustrated as, as I am, let's do something about it. Go to democratsabroad.org slash YC and join the Youth Caucus. We welcome you with our arms wide open. Uh, February is just around the corner, and in the spirit of Black History Month, the Youth Caucus and the Black Caucus will have a social media takeover. So if you don't follow us on social media, please look it up. Uh, look us up on Facebook as Democrats Abroad Youth Caucus and on Instagram as at Dems Abroad Youth. Expect, expect a lot of events from the Youth Caucus coming uh, towards you for the rest of the year. So stay tuned. And if you have any ideas or suggestions for the Youth Caucus, please contact us via email at youthcaucus at democratsabroad.org. And last but not least, don't forget to register to vote and request an overseas ballot. Thank you so much, everyone. And Bruce, take it away. All right, thank you, Miguel. And uh, thanks to our co-host, co-sponsors, panelists, audience, and technical support volunteers for what has been an enlightening, provocative, and inspiring event. I know I'm ready now to tackle the unfinished business of student loan justice and commit to taking action right away. I hope you will too. Then please join ProDA this coming Saturday at 2 p.m. Central European time when we will consider our next steps for all the challenges we confront in this crucial midterm election year. We need your help. Please also join us for our next monthly Mondays for your Progressive Minds event on February 28th at the end of the month when our series leaders, Betsy Atorek and Daniel Stein will present the forefront fight for voting rights and democracy and lead our discussion. As you will see in the event information dropped in the chat box, they have provided compelling video, book and article resources for us to prepare for the meeting and to take action. And please help us reach our goal of 45 donations today so that we can continue our work effectively in 2022 and beyond. Remember, your donation will be doubled during our matching campaign. Last but not least, we encourage all to send ideas for our work to proda at democratsabroad.org. If you wish, stick around now for a few minutes to share student loan stories with us via the chat box. And uh, with that, I encourage an end to the recording and thanks 